Hi. Um, thanks, thanks for hanging in. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and, and get a chance to uh, have some back and forth with you. Uh, we, we've been hearing this evening, this evening about the issue of, of sustainability and how technology can help in this process. And I have a couple of questions to ask you. Um, and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes so you don't be affected by the other people, all right? So first of all, if you close your eyes, and everybody, if you can hear, if you can hear me, would you raise your hand? Okay, good. And if you can't hear me, can you raise your hand? No, you can't, okay. All right, great. So my first question is, when you came to the in this evening, into this room this evening, how many of you would say you were pessimistic about the future? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you would say you are optimistic about the future? Okay. How many of you feel more optimistic about the future as a result of what you've heard this evening? Okay, so here's, 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 here's the answers to your questions, okay. The, about a third of you were pessimistic, about 60% were optimistic, and about 83% found that this evening made you more optimistic. So that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So one of the goals of this evening, I think, has already been met in that regard. So I'm going to speak to you about the issue of the way that technology can, can in fact, and help with regard to sustainability with a focus on the issue of education. And the reason I say education, because we've got lots of problems. You're aware of the problems. I don't have to spend the time. There's a dozen of them there, and you could easily get another dozen problems without any trouble. And in order to solve these problems, I think what we have to do is to focus very, very much on our most valuable renewable resource. And that is about two billion children in the world. These, these children are, will soon be solving the problems we've been talking about this evening, before we know it, all right? And they are looking to us for solutions, for answers, of ways that they can go forward. And the interesting thing about these two billion children is that over 90% of them are living in the, developing, in the underdeveloped world. Most of those are hungry most of the time. Most of, many of them are ill, uh, and most of them have virtually no access to a basic education. If we talk about a wasteful society, this is an enormous waste. Because you've heard from half a dozen people today the possibilities, the, the ideas that can be developed with, when you put your mind to it. But in fact, 90% of the human resources that we have in this world are being we, we, are, we are depriving ourselves of the benefit that they, are, they in fact, could provide us. And that's, that's, to say it most bluntly, really a crime. So in the United States, though, um, we're not doing so well ourselves. The number, of, the number of households that are living on $2 or less per day per person has doubled in the last uh, six or eight years, so 10 years, 96 to 2011, I think it is. All right? So that we are going backwards and not forwards. If you look, if you, if you look at the number of children, it's what, 1.8, 2.8 million children who are living in those households. If you look, in fact, at the food supplies, nearly half of the children in the United States will be on food stamps at some point in their life. Nearly half of them. All right? And if you look at the numbers here for OECD, where we rank against 32 OECD developed countries, where we rank in, in, uh, in reading, where we rank in science, where we rank in math, those are the scores that we're getting. So we have a real problem in the United States of wasting that most valuable renewable resource, which is our own human resources. So what do we do about it? We know that there are some things that have to happen in order for us to reduce that waste and begin to take advantage of the resources that are there. And they come into two categories. They're the social conditions that, require, that are required for us to do it. And there are three very key social conditions that have been kind of referred to earlier by Randy and others. The first one is distributed power. We know that when power is highly concentrated, people do very bad things. When, pay, when power is highly distributed, they tend to be more cooperative, more sharing, more creative. 
So distributed power is a requirement if we're going to solve these problems. And we're, in the United States and most parts of the world, power is being more and more concentrated rather than distributed, and that's a deep problem. Second is transparency. You need transparency in a system in order to have the kind of creativity, the kind of problem solving we're talking about, an openness, in fact, to sharing ideas and transparency. When you have secrecy, you get bad things happening again. And the third is mutual responsibility. It's very easy to say it's the Republicans' problem, it's the Democrats' problem, it's, it's um, Osama bin Laden's problem, all right? It's, it's uh, Monsanto's problem, it's the corporation's problem. It's very easy, the bankers, we, we, it's easy to pick somebody to blame. But in fact, if we're going to have a society which is sustainable, we have to accept our own responsibility for why we got into this mess and not simply to blame, blame somebody else. Those are the societal conditions without which we will not solve these problems. And then there are some personal ones as well. You, Randy talked about them earlier and I'll just will repeat them. First of all, you have to, people have to have a sense of agency, a sense they're able to do something, that they're not helpless, all right? Without, if you feel helpless, God help us, right? God help us, right? Um, <laughs> If the second is, we have to have a sense that what we're doing has meaning. That we're just not just lost and, and, and randomly doing things, but there's some meaning. And the third is, we need a feeling of connection. And one of the most difficult, one of the most painful things to do is to isolate a person from other people. We are social beings. We are connected, we are connected in so many ways, and we're connected to the rest of nature as well. So that everything is connected, and when we disconnect ourselves, by whatever means, we get into real trouble. So you can look at any relationship, whether it's a school, a family, a corporation, and ask those three questions. Does that empower people within that organization, that relationship? Does it give them meaning, and does it give them a feeling of connection? Those are three criteria you can always use, okay? Now, what about open learning as change? Open learning as change says, look, if we're gonna solve these problems that we just talked about, we have to begin taking advantage. We have to begin enabling those 90% of the kids in the world who will, before we know it, be running this world. We have to enable them to begin to take advantage of their talent and for us to take advantage of their talent. We're depriving ourselves from that talent right now. And that's crazy, all right? So what we've said is we want to figure out ways that enable every child, all, all of those children, throughout the world, regardless how remote they are, to have a quality basic education. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have a theory of change. It's a little complicated, but I'll go through it real quickly. First of all, you have to have a catalyst that's local. You have to have an irrationally committed team of people, like some of the people we've heard here, who are in the country, in the location, who are determined to make a change, to be a, a disruptive change, if you will, in that society. Because we're only going to make these problems by total systems changes. Little bits and pieces is not going to do it. Second of all, you have to find a place where you can make a difference. You have to select and identify a place where you can make. Then you have to demonstrate that you can make a difference. Enough dosage that you could really do something. And then, Next, you have to have data that shows you have made a difference. So much of the world today, so much of the change we talk about is what I call faith-based change. Oh, you know, it feels good, you know, it's really good, let's get laptops out for everybody and somehow won't that be great, right? The evidence is something you have to require. What's the evidence that you're really making a difference? And then, maybe one of the most difficult things you have to persuade. The only way we're gonna reach all children is through the public sector. The private sector can be a catalyst. The private sector can help move things along. But the only way that all of those children, those 1.8 billion children in the world, who are not now getting a quality education and we're depriving ourselves of their benefits, is through the public sector, all right? And so you have to be, have a relationship with the public sector. You have to be able to persuade them to take those things for which you have evidence that it works and scale it and scale it to all the kids. And then you have to share it. You have to share it openly so it's transparent, so that the resources and the ideas, your failures as well as your successes are known widely. Okay, now, for total system changes, what are the things we need to do in education? First of all, we need to stop calling it education. We need to, talk, to call it learning. 
it be learning, and it needs to be open learning. And it needs to be an open learning exchange. That's the name of our company, Open Learning Exchange, Olay. All right? So you have to start, you have to start by rethinking what you're doing, and that is move from education to learning. There has to be a strong movement from instruction, top-down instruction, to coaching. I love the model of a coach who stands on the sidelines. The people on the, play, on the ground are doing the work. They're playing the game. The coach is there to help them play the game more effectively. That's the model we need to think about in education. Second of all, we need to move from passive learning where, it's, where you're just receiving things where the learner is actively involved, engaging, and using their learning in a meaningful, in a meaningful way, a sense of agency, a sense of connection. See those three things, pop by it again. All right, and we sometimes need, to, and we need, need to also recognize that one size doesn't fit all. So we need to be able to each person to learn at their own rate in their own way and not put everybody into the same box. And finally, we need to make sure that we reach the most marginalized, the disabled, the people who, don't, who are challenged in one way or another, either because of their background or their physical conditions and so forth. They are also human beings and we need to figure out how to reach them, okay? Now, so here's a village in, 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 uh, in Ghana where we are working. Um, and here's some of the kids there, eager to learn, so excited, that you, you know, it's, it's just wonderful to see them. And what we just said is, okay, these kids, one of the things they need is they need information. They need to be able to have access to knowledge, and the first thing they need to be able to is to read, because if you can't read, you're really stuck, all right? If you can't read, you're really stuck. So let's start out by ensuring that they can read. And let's do that by giving them a library so they can have materials to lead. And let's do that by giving them a digital library that they can use and so on. So here's a picture of the digital library that we've got. Uh, just setting up in the handshake there, turning it over to the school because it's now their library. Here's the server. About the size, here's the server. It's about this big, right? It, it runs the entire school library of about two terabytes of data. All right? It takes three and a half volts to run it. All right? It has Wi-Fi. All right? It costs $25. So for $25, we can have an entire library sitting in a school way out in the disk, running on a car battery or a solar cell. Right? Isn't that something? It, it's absolutely fascinating. It's called, called Raspberry Pi, if you have the name of it. Right? And, 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 and here's, the, here's the tablet that is have Wi-Fi connected, a $50 tablet, color tablet, $50, all right? Six children are going to use those tablets. You figure out if they last four years, you're talking about $2 per child per year for a tablet which has four gigabytes of data on it, four gigabytes. It, has all, it can have all the textbooks, all of the stuff that they want, and here's what they see, my library. They sign in, they get their own personal library. The last thing that they read, just like on Kindle, the books that they need to read, access to a larger library, that's their personal library, and it's independent of the tablet. They just sign in, no matter what tablet they have, and they, that's what they get, and they have their own personal library they can work at at their own rate, okay? So <clears throat> this is the kind of things in the library. The library includes not just the server, but a printer, a projector, video camera, uh, a LCD screen, and so in fact, and it can be it can deliver in lots of different ways, Wi-Fi to the mobiles, wired to the rest, and what we say is that you're not only receiving information, but you're also creating it. So one of the things we said to do, go out into the country, go out into your village, and gather data on what's going on in your village, and they did that. Now here's the teachers learning, first of all, learning how to reach, use some of these tablets and they're really excited about it, and I hope this thing will work now. Here's the teacher, just, you can see her, and watch the, watch the kid now. Here comes the kid. Oh, he's so excited. <laughs> so this is the first time they've had those tablets in that classroom. You're just total excitement, all right? And here they are now reading for the first time. And, and it's interesting, the teacher says, you know, I was worried about this before, I thought it'd be more work. Actually, it's less work, because now they're reading, I don't have to be talking all the time. <laughs> All right? And the other teacher is saying, I had to unlearn a lot of things I learned in school. Because, in fact, this changes the way learning occurs. All right? Now, here's another. They went out to the village. They took, they took questions. Here they are trying to figure out what questions to ask. 
Now this, if you, you can imagine what the classroom was before this kind of thing. These are kids now who are actively trying to solve a problem in a meaningful way about their own community. And, and you like that too. Now here's, here's the report. Here's the report. These are the things that they found. You can read it. Poor road, poor sanitation, market not active, no hospital, no sites for the community, no, no places to meet in the community, a school going children out, no computers in this classroom and hunger in the crowd. The three check marks, they say, those are going to be our campaign for the year. This is fifth grade students who went into the village, gathered data, wrote a report, said we're going to have a campaign fight for our rights for the next year. This has happened in fifth grade, right? It's incredible, incredible. So, now one of the other things we said to do is you gotta have a newspaper. You gotta write a newspaper, you and the kids and the students together, you write a newspaper, you print it on the printer, you post it in the village, so that you begin to create knowledge and not simply absorb it. You begin to be creators of knowledge instead of absorbing it. And that's the first issue of that newspaper that they sent. They went out and they posted it around the village for people to read. All right, so that, that's the kind of thing that they're doing. Now, next year, we're going to 20 schools. And it's not, it's not only just cool about 20 schools, but let me tell you what's really cool about this, in fact, aside from the fact that it's 20 schools, is that now what we have is a system whereby the bell system is not simply a delivery system of information to the kids and the schools, it's also a delivery system into the capital, into the center. Because every time, this is off the internet, you understand, this is not on the internet, the, the schools are not on the internet. You take flash drive, and you go to the nearest internet cafe, you put it in, and you dial into the National Library in Accra, right? And when you're in the National Library in Accra, they download new information, the news and so forth, so your library gets updated. The other thing that happens is it uploads data. What's been used in that school? What's the, what ratings the stuff has been getting? What comments they have? And so now the National Library is able to provide this kind of a report. What are the things that are highest rated by the schools, by the 20 schools of the things out there? What are the things that are most frequently opened? What are the recommended, what are the lowest rated resources that need some work, all right? And, and wh what schools are using it most and what schools are using it least? A little competition there, yeah, right? And one of the things, again, that we're doing, this is so cool, they've got a camera, they're gonna do a video, video festival. So at the end of the school year, in June of next year, these 20 schools are gonna show at a film festival the video that they made and get a prize for the best one and the next best one and so forth. So again, creating content, using the technology and doing that. So, the lessons learned, you gotta have local leadership. It's gotta be irrational, it's gotta be, it's gotta be there. You've gotta have collaboration, so that in fact, you're not working alone, the silos don't work anymore, you gotta reach out to all kinds of different places. You've gotta have a total system change. Bits and pieces will not do the job. You've gotta have a total system change, you got to, it needs to be evidence-based, faith-based isn't going to work anymore, right? Uh, there needs to be high enough dosage. One of the big reasons for failure is, in fact, because you don't do enough. So you got to do enough, but you do enough in such a way that it actually scales, so that it can reach out. So you need low cost, like the $25 server, right? That sort of thing. And it needs to be activity-based so that these rules that I talked about, agency and and meaning and connection apply to every student in that school. It, technology is the last thing you introduce here. You get the solution, you figure out how you can use it, but don't bring your technology in until you've got all the other things in place. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time and your money and your technology. And you need persistence. It's not an easy thing to do. You can easy to get discouraged. You have to stay with it. Some friend of mine says that, if, if, if it doesn't take 10 years to make the difference, you're not doing enough, okay? It, it, it takes time to get this done, and it takes a lot of courage. So the bottom line is, that's the bottom line. The bottom line is, got it? Okay, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> bottom line, that's the bottom line. The bottom line is that in fact, it is possible to make change. It takes all of us together to work on it, but it can be done. Thank you very much.